socks, no shoes. By the throat, do we think? Silencing her? Silent or silenced? <laughs> Shall we watch another episode of Hannibal? Rhetorical question. I'm talking to myself. Well, kind of talking to a camera, aren't I? On this video, I'm going to watch episode six of season one because it's got some really interesting stuff about psychopathy, about medical confidentiality, about prison healthcare, insanity. Ready? Let's crack on. This, is your this final looks more like fly. a prison than a hospital. On your feet, Dr. Gideon, or we will restrain you. And they're saying, Doctor. So I presume this is yet another evil psychiatrist because most evil doctors on TV shows are psychiatrists or a surgeon because ego. Love you surgeons. Before we get into the nitty gritty of the video though, I have a question for you for the comments down below. What do you think is the difference between a psychopath and a sociopath? Pause the video, give me your answer in the comments below and then as time goes on on this video and maybe a few others in the near future, we'll see if you're right. Secure hospitals or forensic hospitals are always concerned about risk to others. That's usually what they can provide over non-secure hospitals is better resources to manage the risk to others, particularly towards the general public. In a case like this though, the risk seems to be more towards himself because he is presenting as somebody physically unwell within a, a room or a cell that maybe from a distance the staff are thinking, is he really unwell or is he feigning? Which is basically a fancy medical word for faking. By feigning, the door gets unlocked, people come closer, you can perpetrate an assault and perhaps try and escape. Unfortunately, this presumption of feigning is all too common rather than actually taking people for what they are, which is potentially physically unwell, and taking the necessary precautions to uh, mitigate against potential risk to others or escape. Yeah, so he's unconscious. and being checked on by prison officers. Get a gurney. Oh, this is meant to be a hospital. So he's either genuinely ill or he's taken something like a beta blocker to slow his heart rate down and to lower his blood pressure to the point that his pulse is incredibly weak. Let's say this is a prison, for example. Prison healthcare is complicated because let's face it, the provisions for healthcare are poorer in a prison, yet the burden of physical illness and mental illness is higher and then there's the risk management side of things as well. It has been widely established that the prevalence of mental disorders in prison is higher than in the general population, whether this is mood disorders, psychotic disorders, um, substance use disorders, personality disorders, self-harm. But despite the higher prevalence of illness, they're frequently underdiagnosed. Add further to that, that some mental illnesses can be a risk factor for reoffending. Untreated and acute psychosis can be. And untreated mental illness is also a risk factor for premature mortality upon release. You can hear his heart rate, so he's clearly not taking a beta blocker. And that line is so flat, I was going to say that means the ECG machines are off. And it's a hospital, not a prison. So with the hospital name, they've used the term criminally insane. Insanity is a legal term. It is not a medical term. Insanity, at least in the UK, is a psychiatric defence against certain criminal offences, but one that is actually has a very, very, very high threshold to uphold. There are some variations in the legislation between countries, but in the UK, there's a legal test called the McNaughton Rules, whereby somebody needs to have a defect of reasoning caused by a disease of the mind to the point that either they didn't know the nature and the quality of the act that they did, or if they did know the nature and the quality of the act, that they didn't know it was wrong, by which we mean legally wrong. So most people, even the most acutely mentally unwell people, will not reach the threshold for the legal definition of insanity. Medical and legal concepts frequently do not map onto each other nice and neatly. Why was a nurse left alone with a prisoner in a high security psychiatric hospital? Good question. For the two years since he was brought here, Gideon behaved perfectly and gave every appearance of cooperating with attempts at therapy. As dictated Pierce. by our present administrator, security around him was slightly relaxed. Much like mental states, risk is dynamic. It changes over time. It can go up over time, it can reduce over time, and it can fluctuate a lot rather than going nice and neatly up or nice and neatly down. You're quite the topic of conversation in the psychiatric circles, Mr. Graham. Is he doing psychiatric gossip? Uh, uh, yes. A unique cocktail of personality disorders and neuroses that make you a highly skilled profiler. He's not here to be analyzed. Perhaps he should be. <laughs> we don't always analyze people. All there is psychiatrists with no boundaries that keep analyzing people and 
eating people. And neurosis is a completely outdated term, even when this was filmed. That was uh, an outdated term for a range of anxiety disorders, generalised anxiety disorders, phobias, OCD, PTSD. It's today an irrelevant term and it's just so wishy-washy also he does not have a personality disorder nor can you or should you be diagnosing a personality disorder off of second or third hand information or sort of snapshot meetings we all have personality traits some of those are helpful in some circumstances and problematic in others this is what makes us human a personality disorder is when one or more of those traits becomes so intense and so overwhelmingly problematic towards our day-to-day -day function in multiple aspects of our life and it, and it's been this way since our personality has been shaped and developed in our early adolescence and into our adulthood there needs to be significant impairment of your function that can be traced back to your early development development that is if the diagnosis is done properly and accurately because it's a detailed one so gideon was restrained handcuffed mm. he concealed a fork tie in the palm of his hand and used it to pick the lock where is he now in his cell you'll note the removal of organs and the abdominal mutilations are all consistent with the chesapeake ripper so is the brutalization of the corpses but that doesn't change the fact that the ripper is still out there jack what i'm about to show you Suggest otherwise. So he's diagnosing and treating patients in this unit, but he's also consulting with the police? Medicine and the police need to be separate. For example, I talked about insanity versus mental illness. This is just one example of where health and the criminal justice system do not see eye to eye. And I know that the definition of what forensic psychiatrists do varies depending on the jurisdictions and varies in countries around the world. But in the UK, as a forensic psychiatrist, I see my job as being someone who assesses, diagnoses and treats mental illness in people that have been charged with or convicted of a criminal offence. I still see my job as diagnosing and treating mental illness. In the UK, any involvement of forensic psychiatrists as expert witnesses in criminal investigations and trial processes is done in an independent capacity, is done completely separate to any uh, involvement that we have with the NHS in assessing and treating our patients. Dr. Chilton consulted on the case when we failed to catch the Ripper after his last series of murders. So this is quite the conflict of interest, isn't it? He's assessing and treating this guy as his patient, so in a clinical capacity, yet there's clearly some professional jealousy that he's no longer involved as part of the criminal investigation side of things with this Jessapeake Ripper. There's worryingly a sort of voyeuristic component, perhaps. In your letter, you said you wanted to work for me in the Violent Criminal Apprehension Program. Yes, sir. There might be an opportunity. I'm assuming that you're familiar with the Chesapeake Ripper. Yes. The Ripper's very hot right now. Killed his last two victims in six days. There'll be at least one more body and then nothing for months. They say he's a true sociopath. Sociopath is so American. I say they don't know what else to label him. He has some of the characteristics of what they call a sociopath. No remorse or guilt at all. He won't have any of the other marks. He won't be a drifter. He'll have no history of trouble with the law. He'll be hard to catch. We don't use the term sociopath in the UK. Psychopath used to be an actual medical diagnosis um, around about the DSM-3, but it's not anymore. So psychopathy today represents a specific set of cognitive and emotional traits that make up what we consider a severe subset of antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial PD is, is mostly a behavioural diagnosis, persistent law-breaking, lying, a tendency to blame others, impulsivity, but psychopathy refers to those sort of cold, callous traits that might underpin that behaviour. You know, a lack of remorse, a lack of victim empathy. The volume of Abel Gideon's mail is becoming a nuisance. Sometimes I feel like his secretary rather than his keeper. Any specific correspondences that stood out from the others? Mostly researchers or PhD candidates requesting interviews, a scattered dozen lonely hearts seeking his hand in marriage. I think we need to do a full proper video on why it is that people fall in love with high profile criminal offenders. Very prison-esque, not hospital-esque. 
I've never seen a padded cell in the UK, either in hospitals or prisons. I don't think they're really a thing. They might be overseas, though. If they are, if you're a healthcare professional that works in mental health overseas and they are a thing, tell me. I'm really interested to know about some of the variations in our practice. You're just going to run the psychopathic checklist here. I have had my personality inventoried by the Minnesota Multiphasic. Would you prefer a Rorschach test? If you're going to show me those pictures, maybe you should put a blood pressure cuff to my genitals. I find it gives a much truer gauge of reaction. He's not wrong with the Rorschach test. Psychometric tools can help us with the diagnosis of a personality disorder. So the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory is a test that can be used, particularly by psychologists. It looks for the intensity of certain personality traits. You know, when we assess for conditions like depression and psychosis, we try and compare a person's mental state now, when they're unwell, to their own mental state at a time that they were well. So we compare them now to them, maybe when they were well, and then hopefully in the future when they get well, we get to compare them to them again. Again, at different moments in time. We're comparing you to you at different time points, which gives us an idea of when things are off and you're unwell, but also when you're, you're responding to treatment and you're back to your baseline. Personality disorder is not an episodic illness. It's a pervasive disorder that is there since your early development. So we can't really just conveniently compare you now with a personality disorder to when you didn't have one. So these tools compare a person's personality traits to population data, i.e. these traits are more prominent than in X percent of the population. They don't diagnose in and of themselves, but they support more clinical diagnoses of conditions like a personality disorder. You don't think I have a right to know what's happening with my wife? No. You have every right to know what's happening, but not for me. Look at Hannibal being spot on medically in between, you know, questionable ethics of eating people. The right to confidentiality has its limits. The right to confidentiality does not equal the right to absolute secrecy. But just because your partner is unhappy that you want to keep someone confidential, that's not one of those exceptions. Sorry, you got to deal with it between yourselves. There is a duty to inform if someone's at imminent risk of harm, including safeguarding concerns um, and disclosure of some of the most serious criminal offences, though disclosure about a criminal act does not mean you have to disclose any medical information alongside that. Do you know what profession psychopaths disproportionately gravitate to? Don't say psychiatry, don't CEOs, say psychiatry. Lawyers, the clergy. Number five on the list is surgeons. You know the list. <laughs> that makes sense. And oh, then you know what number six is. Journalists. Journalists. There you go. Where's you know the what police? Seven is, Mr. Graham. Law enforcement. There you go. <laughs> It may well be that there are people with prominent traits of psychopathy in high achieving fields like medicine, law, business, though the presence of those psychopathic traits will never be fully established unless you're first diagnosed with an antisocial personality disorder, and that will only be diagnosed if you come to the attention of the criminal justice system. So outside of a formal diagnosis of antisocial PD, describing somebody as psychopathic as nothing more than a colloquial descriptor of someone being cold, callous, ruthless, perhaps with a perceived... Uh, 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 lack of any sense of remorse. You were a model patient. What does that mean? You behaved yourself. Yeah, it just means years. behaving as we want well, you to behave. That's what model patient means. No opportunity to be naughty. You could have been pushed. Well, that would be unethical. I can help you find out. But I need your trust to do that. Model patient basically means he does as he's told. The question should really be about the quality of his engagement with various types of therapeutic interventions, not just simply whether he shows up and does as he's told. Were I in your position, I would have attempted psychic driving. Perhaps you already have. I promise. I'm much more forgiving of the unorthodox than Dr. Bloom. Psychic driving was one of those so-called treatments of the 1950s where patients were subjected to these sort of continuously repeated audio messages on a loop to try and alter people's behaviour. Unsurprisingly, it was basically used as a torture technique in projects like MKUltra to try and convince people that they've done something that they haven't and they were often administered alongside paralytic drugs. So you're there paralyzed, hearing this on a loop, trying to convince you that you've done something that you haven't. Really, it's a form of medical torture. What would be the benefit of making you believe your trainee was alive? Hope. 
and hope's really interesting. You never want to cloud my vision with hope. You can sometimes be brave to allow yourself hope. I think hope's really interesting. In my experience, hope can be both motivating and provocative, sometimes both at the same time. It's motivating as now you've got perhaps something to aim for, some light at the end of the tunnel, but provocative because this now also gives you something to lose. With that comes pressure and the tendency to say, sod it, and if one thing goes badly, I'm going to jack it all in and self-sabotage. If it's the gentleman I'm thinking of, I vaguely remember a fellow hunter bringing him in, but I recall very little else. Figured it was a long shot. I did keep detailed journals during those days. If you like, I can get them for you. Maybe you'll find something helpful. That would be great, if you don't mind. Not at all. So we're definitely going to be breaching confidentiality here and patient confidentiality, uh, blah, 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 talking too much, aren't I? Patient confidentiality and anonymity goes well beyond just what someone's name and date of birth is. If the patient reads a descriptor of their case and recognise that it's them, even from the description of the nature of the problem and the treatment, etc., that's a breach of confidentiality. So healthcare professionals and social media, please pay attention to that, particularly if you're sharing what you think are anonymised cases for education purposes. Socks, no shoes. Why the throat, do we think? Silencing her? Silent or silenced? <laughs> Let me know what you thought, though, in the comments below. And I'll see you for another video very, very soon. Love you, bye.